Hi everyone, uh, welcome to my little platform on which I will hopefully help you guys learn a little bit more about how to research stocks. And I mean, the, the tagline, it probably gives away that my, my um, native tongue is not English, but where to even start um, is a question that I get a lot from people. Um, because it's all good and well to talk about ratios and financial statements analysis and building a model and all these complicated things and technicals and Bollinger Bands and all the rest. But I guess what, what really boggles people is where do you even get an idea of, of what to invest in? So this evening's presentation, I will start with how to find those ideas, how to get those, those, those ideas. Uh, even if there's nothing that comes to mind, even if there's nothing that's fallen 80%, even if you haven't received a tip, which you should, by the way, never follow, and I'll go into a bit more detail around that later. And then once you've generated those ideas, how to make sure your idea is an actual good one, that you're investing in a good company, um, and that you will end up not being completely devastated um, when it all falls to pieces. Um, and then finally, just a few kind of rules to, to live by and actually just one or rules to invest by and actually just one. Um, but without ado, I will get started with this. So why have a research process? I think that every single investor should have a research process and not just an, a professional investor. But whenever you are investing in stocks specifically, you need to be very sure that what you are doing is something that you are comfortable with. Because any level of discomfort, because you're not sure of your choice or because you relied on a tip. Um, in this slide, I specifically men mention um, your dentist's brother's nephew's teacher. Um, you will be uncomfortable with it and it will, it will result in you being paranoid around your choice. You'll keep on checking your portfolio. Um, I'm a daily portfolio checker, so I'm, I'm not judging anyone, but I think you, you have comfort in your investments when you are actually following a set research process and you're not just relying on kind of pie in the sky ideas. So first things first, before you even start thinking about what to invest in, you need to really understand yourself and you need to understand what type of investor you are. And there are three key questions here. Are you a long-term investor? So are you looking to invest in something and hold it for three to five years or maybe even forever? Or are you a short-term investor? Do you want to make a quick buck and then move on? If you're a long-term investor, this is probably the, the webinar for you. Um, I'm a long-term investor. I'm a big believer in long-term investments. The market outperforms every, the equity market outperforms every single other asset class over time. But the short term can be completely different and then you will rely um, on things like technical analysis, which I'm also a fan of, by the way, but I'm a fan of technical analysis in terms of looking for potential entry points or selling opportunities rather than trying to, to look for a quick buck over a very short period of time. Then what style of investor are you? Like what piques your interest? Do you like big growth stories like a, like a tech stock? Do you like something like, um, like Google or Meta or Tesla? Are you looking for something that is going to start small and become absolutely massive? Are you a value investor? Do you like stuff that has been completely beaten down into the ground? Did you, did you scratch around Avenge and PPC um, a year or two ago? Um, you may be a value investor, um, or are you a quality investor? Do you just want something that you can, that will make you sleep comfortably at night and that will give you those solid, steady returns over time? Um, I personally, personally am a quality investor, although I do get duped into value investing now and again. Um, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. In our household, it is always a point of, of discussion. Um, my husband's also in the financial services industry, and he is a big value guy. Avenge, PPC, uh, you name it, EOH, he, he's gone into all of them. Um, whereas I want to know exactly where this company is going. I want to understand the management team, um, and I want to make sure that the ideas aren't too big and too grand to actually execute on. And then how involved are you going to be as an investor? Are you looking at your portfolio every day or are you buying stuff that you can just kind of 
leave. And usually when you are a quality investor, um, it, or usually that kind of leans towards a quality investor. So if you want to buy stuff and you don't want to look at your portfolio every day, or you're not inclined to look at your portfolio every day, quality stocks are probably for you. Um, but I mean, as I said, I, I look at my portfolio every day, even though I am a quality investor. So I am absolutely um, not judging everyone. I think the trick then lies to not become uh, panicky when what you analyze doesn't, or what you, what you think is going to happen doesn't immediately happen. Then where do you get those ideas? Okay, so I mean the sources are infinite and, and that's where the problem lies. So um, you can watch something like Stockwatch and there'll be a stock pick um, every night that you can that you can maybe um, get an idea from. Uh, you can use inspiration as you go about your daily life. I mean, I, I do mention on the slide deck that pick and pay on Mr. D was quite an interesting one to me. Um, when I opened my Mr. Delivery app to order Mexican fresh for lunch, which is my guilty pleasure. I saw that I can actually order from Pick and Pay. And I know they had a separate app, but I just like this idea of Pick and Pay and Mr. D tying up. And it's just another way of them to get a way for them to get their groceries in our homes and really compete effectively with something like a ShopRite. So perhaps Pick and Pay is something that I can consider. Um, stock screens, that's the one that I'm going to focus on. I'm going to show you how to effectively use a stock screen. And then finally, tips. Um, on the slide pack, I say just don't. It's it's usually too late. So you've you've come onto the information way too late. Everyone, all the smart money, as they call it, is already in the stock. Um, or it's just plain illegal. Um, and in the in the yellow um, in the yellow kind of circle on the slide pack, I just mentioned it's um, up to two million rand or ten years in prison if you get caught inside of trading. Um, and I just watched Steinice, so that is the cost of trading on Marcus Eustace's SMS um, back in 2017. So the humble stock screener. So what a stock screener essentially does is it takes the entire universe that you're looking at. So in this case, we are going to look at JSE listed shares. And you look at a few factors, or you determine a few factors that you want to focus on. Again, there are so, so many. So um, there are a lot for you to actually choose from. I'm going to highlight some of the ones that I like to look at when I look at a stock screener. Um, and you can also get some really expensive fancy ones that give you some forecasts. But I think that the, the, the idea of this presentation is that anyone with absolutely no, with no additional cost to them should be able to use a stock screen. And there are some really uh, fabulous free ones out there. Um, my example is going to use the one on investing.com, uh, which is quite effective. I tried out a few other ones, but I found them to be quite clunky and, and not very effective. So I've done that work for you. Um, but it's very important to not just trade on what uh, stock screen spits out, right? It's going to give you, you're going to look at a universe of 250 stocks. It's going to give you 30 odd stocks if you are, if, if you use the, the metrics that, that I used. Um, but that doesn't mean that all 30 of those stocks are good. Uh, it just means that all 30 of those stocks are ideas. So that is a, it's, it's very important that you realize that it is a, it, it's absolutely a starting point. Just like my idea would have been to think about pick and pay. I would be a starting point because I saw it on the Mr. Delivery app. It doesn't mean that it is a good, it is a, a, a it is a good stock. So um, as I mentioned, there are lists and lists of, of um, things you can use to screen these stocks. So um, uh, my my mentor, who is now long long retired, used to say garbage in, garbage out when it came to a model. Um, and in this case, uh, I'll repeat it in the stock screen as well. Um, if the metrics you are using to screen stocks by are absolute garbage or pointless, then you're probably going to get garbage or pointless stocks um, as your ideas that you are now going to research further and you're absolutely just going to, um, to waste your time. So what do I use? So what I have here is uh, the humble stock screener from investing.com. 
And I've chosen, you can see there's on the left side, there's lots of criteria that you can use. Uh, popular, probably not the one that you should be picking stuff off of, although there could be a few good ones. There are ratios, price movements, volume and volatility, fundamental stuff, so cash flows and balance sheets and income statements, dividends and technical indicators. I like a little bit of everything. So um, the ones I really like to use is firstly market cap. So um, I prefer to invest in stocks that are slightly larger just because information is more readily available and it's, easily, it's easier to trade. Although if you are looking for small caps specifically, this is also a useful tool to make, your, um, to make your, your, your universe smaller, right? So if you're looking for small cap stocks, you would want to look at something below 2 billion Rand and then you might start getting some really interesting stuff in that space. But for the purpose of this exercise, I've taken it. I've taken the screen to above five billion rand. Um, one year change. So I personally don't love it when a stock has already run hard. It doesn't mean that it's a bad buy. It just means that it, you know, it's not the easy money has already been made. So I would want a stock that has returned less than fifteen percent over the last year. Um, fifteen being quite an arbitrary number. I mean, you can decide where your comfort level is. Um, but yeah, fifteen percent is my arbitrary number. I like stocks that pay dividends. Um, it gives you a good idea of um, you, you kind of get that cash flow magic going. So if a company is able to consistently pay dividends, um, their cash flow statement seems to be in good nick. And I'll go into a bit more detail on that a little, a little bit later. The RSI, my technical indicator of choice, the RSI is called, it's, a, it's the relative strength indicator and it basically um, spits out a value between uh, 0 and 100. And from a technical standpoint, if it goes above 70, it means that there are a lot of buyers in the market and that the stock is likely overbought or what is termed overbought. And when it's below 30, it generally indicates that a stock is oversold or there's a lot of of sellers in the market. And usually because a lot of technical traders trade on the RSI, when a stock falls below 30, there tends to be a technical bounce, is what they, that's what they call it. And if a stock goes above 70, um, the opposite can happen just from a technical standpoint. So I wouldn't want to invest in a stock that is oversold or approaching or overbought or approaching overbought levels. Don't mind buying something that's super oversold. So um, I took it to the minimum and then 50 um, as, as something kind of in between, either overbought or oversold. And then the final metric that I like to use in a stock screener is the beta. Um, the beta basically measures how a stock moves relative to the rest of the market. So if you look at a stock that is very high beta, or they'll call it high beta, it means that when the market goes up 1%, this stock goes up way more than 1%. When the market goes down 1%, it goes down way more than 1%. So that volatility is quite big. Um, if a beta is very low, it means that it's almost uncorrelated with the market. So um, it, it kind of does its own thing. But I mean, you don't necessarily want that specifically when you are faced with a market that has been under a lot of pressure, right? You want to, you want to benefit from a rising tide um, if the rising tide finally comes. Um, let's just ignore today's CPI prints um, in the US. So what did I get when I did this last week? Apologies, guys. Just as a, as, a, as a caveat, I did this last week. I had laser eye surgery on my eyes on Monday. I've been unable to see since then. So this I actually did on, on Thursday afternoon. So I would implore on you to not trade on this information, but rather to run your own stock screen and, and see what it spits out uh, today. A lot can change in financial markets in a week. So what I basically got was a whole list of REITs. All the, all the largest cap property stocks on the JSE basically was spit out. Financials, again, the large cap financials were spit out. Resources here and there, there were a few. South 32 kind of piqued my interest. Um, but the, the industrial space um, I found really interesting. I thought there were some really interesting names there. Um, and that's where I'm going to focus for the purposes of, of this webinar. Because if you get a stock screen that spits out all the big REITs, you may as well just buy the, the, the property tracker, right? The ETF. If you get a stock screen that spits out all the big, um, the, the big financial companies, 
by Fini 15 Tracker, um, your your work is basically <laughs> your work is basically done for you. So for that reason, I it hypothetically I would have bought a prop tracks, I would have bought a Fini 15 ETF, and I would have investigated the industrials further. Um, perhaps park the resources a bit, um, just given the where the global economy is currently and where the commodity cycle is. So we're looking at the industrials. Now we have to filter it out more. We've got Anheuser Busch, Steinoff, MTN, Mr. Price, Shini, Bitcorp, Bitvest, Truett, and Cap. So where do we start? Red flags. I don't like Steinoff. No one likes Steinoff. I'm not going to invest in Steinoff. It's okay. It's okay to think something's just dodgy and you don't want to look at it further. Uh, Anheuser Busch and Bitcorp. I eliminated those two because the RAND is exceptionally weak. These are RAND hedge stocks, which means that when the RAND weakens, these stocks tend to do well. Odds are the RAND can still weaken, but it probably won't weaken by much more. It is exceptionally weak as is. So I've eliminated those stocks for the purpose of this, of this exercise. So what I'm left with was Cap, Truett, Bitvest, Bushini, Mr. Price, and MTN. Now, I would probably go into all of them, but what really stood out to me and what was quite interesting and that I thought could be quite helpful was that we had three major retailers in here, clothing retailers specifically, or discretionary retailers, Mr. Price, Pushini, and Truett. So those are the ones that I'm going to focus on. Um, separately, um, I would have probably also dialed into MTN, in Bitcorp, and Cup, but a comparative is always more interesting than looking at a stock completely on its own. So now we have to dig deeper. We've got three stocks that we've decided to look at. We have to dig deeper. The hard work is going to start now. It's going to get technical. Um, we have to learn more about the companies, uh, it, apart from just walking into Pushini and saying, I don't like the clothes here. Um, we need to analyze the financial statements, make sure that the stocks are in a good financial standing and that they're actually making money. And then finally, we have to look at the valuation to decide if it's if we're actually interested in buying the stock and if the stock screen wasn't just spitting out something based on an anomaly. So learning about the company, again, three things. I'm a fan of threes. The macros, the economy, how's the economy faring and how does that actually impact this specific sector? Industry specifics, what are the factors that are driving this, the, the industry at the moment? Where is where are people shopping at the moment? Where, what are, what do the trends look like? What are they are their tastes look like? Um, what are their tastes? What are their tastes rather? And I mean stuff like online and how their online presence is stuff like that really uh, is important as well when you're looking at a company. And then company specifics: what do they do? What are their brands? Where do they operate? Um, and what are they trying to achieve? So in the macros, if we look at discretionary retailers, it's probably not that supportive, right? Because we have economy slowing down globally. The South African economy is under quite a bit of pressure. Um, and it looks like there could be a recession in many economies globally um, and even in South Africa because of the, the knock-on impacts. We also have some South Africa-specific factors like load shedding playing a role, um, investor confidence, consumer confidence and business confidence being under quite a bit of pressure. Um, on the industry side, retail stocks are pro-cyclical. What that means is that when the economy weakens, then these stocks also tend to, to, come, um, to come under pressure. Um, but it's very important to look at the semantics though. So when the economy comes under pressure, a few things happen. So not all retail stocks will perform poorly. For example, food retailers will probably benefit from an environment like what we have currently, high inflation, um, people uh, spending a lot more of their discretionary income or of their income on food, um, and you end up with less money for clothing, but you still need clothing. So what people tend to do is they start trading down. And that's where things get quite interesting for the set of stocks that we have. Um, we have Mr. Price that already targets a, a lower um, LSM consumer, um, specifically with their, their new um, foray into discount retailing through power fashion. And then um, we've got the Fashini group that purchased Jets when it was in distress from, from Edcon. So that could be a potential, um, a, a potential uh, tailwind for something like a Truist. 
Um, obviously, when you read into the company itself, that's where this stuff starts becoming a little bit more apparent because you might not know that, that the Fashini Group actually owns Jet. Um, and then importantly, you need to think, well, I mean, what is already priced in? Uh, it's, a, it's a term that we use quite often in stock analysis because markets are forward looking. So we need to think what is already priced in. Thankfully, our stock screen tells us that these companies don't look specifically expensive. So um, there could be some opportunities here, perhaps something that the, that the market is missing. Um, then when we're learning about a company, I'm not going to read through every single one of these things. The presentation will be made available um, later on. But typically, we would look at for discretionary retailers, what are the brands that these companies have? I mean, even as I was researching these stocks for, for this webinar, um, I, I actually did not know that TFG owns G-Star Raw. Um, I actually did not know that. Um, Mr. Price, I know, has increased its, um, its portfolio of companies quite a bit over the last few years. As I mentioned, Power Fashion, it's now also bought Studio 88, um, and it also purchased Yappy Shape a year or so ago. Um, and then Truers is a lot more than just that empty Truers. Um, you've got YDE, Loads of Living, Nachi, um, Earth Child. I think those two acquisitions were, were probably pretty good for it. Um, and then you look at where they operate. Um, do they offer credit in discretionary retailers specifically? That is important. Have they made any recent acquisitions? And then you look at the management team. How long has the management team been around? Um, and I mean, you can see that Mr. Price has a relatively new management team, but most of them have been employed in the group forever. Um, TFG, also a relatively new management team, although they've, they've been there a little bit longer than the Mr. Price management team, but they haven't been around nearly as long as the Mr. Price management team. And then Truett stands out. Michael Mark has been CEO since 1991. Um, wow. So something like that would definitely stand out to me. Um, I know that they've recently appointed two deputy CEOs. It was all over the news. So perhaps finally that handover is coming, but is it really a time to invest in a company when they are going to have a massive change in management? Then we have to look at the financials. It's about to get technical. We have to look at profitability, the income statement. Uh, are they actually making money? Uh, are, they, are their sales increasing? We have to look at financial position, the balance sheet. What do their assets look like? What do their liabilities look like? Specifically debt is something that you can always um, zone in on. And then the cash flow statement, the ever important cash flow statement, because a company can look like they're making money, but it doesn't translate into hard cash. And um, I think that that is probably one of the, the most important things for an investor to, to look at when they're analyzing a company. And then finally, management commentary, and you could probably add market commentary to that as well. So um, look at management commentary, look at what other analysts are saying about the company, um, look about look at um, what news headlines are saying about the company. Uh, it could at least give you an idea of whether or not there are any red flags when you are when you are thinking about investing in a specific stock. Then what I've done here is I've actually looked I've, I've highlighted the most important factors to look at for the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. And this looks super complicated, and you're welcome to go through this. Um, in, in your own time, but I'm not going to go through every single one of these. What I've essentially done is I've looked at every single metric. So revenue, gross profit margin, operating profit margin, finance costs and taxes, earnings per share, dividends, and the management outlook statement. And I've highlighted in the FMB turquoise, which one is actually performing the best. So I'm doing like almost a comparative analysis around this. And that's why I love doing comparative analyses. I think it, it gives you a much more robust result. So on revenue, TFG wins. Revenue up 84% over five years. That's 13% annualized. Gross profit margin, Mr. Price wins up to 43.2% from 38.8% in FY17. So that's over the last five years. Operating profit margin, Truett's wins. Finance costs and taxes, TFG wins. Surprisingly, I did not see that coming. Earnings per share, Mr. Price wins. Dividends, Truett's wins. Also did not see that coming. 
and then the management outlook statement. The really great thing about management outlook statements is they give you a clue around how the company is performing after the results that they've already released. So you know if a company, say, releases results to the end of September, they'll give you, a, well, September is probably a bad example, to the end of June, they'll give you an idea of how trading has been in July and August because their results release will be in September. So you get a clue as to how the company is performing in the new financial year that they haven't already covered. On the balance sheet, I like to look at working capital. Um, so working capital is basically how a company conducts its business. So working capital is inventory. So how much stock do they have? You don't want a clothing company to have too much stock on hand because they'll end up having to, to, to run discounts and promotions and sell that stock at lower margins in order to clear space for new inventory. Trade receivables, that means how much money is owned, is, is owed to them by their customers. Trade payables, how much money do they owe their suppliers? And this is important because it tells you how healthy the business is. If a company takes too long, for example, to pay its suppliers, it's a red flag. It means that the company is, is, is probably not on good terms with its suppliers and that they might have a cash flow issue. Um, and, and I mean, when you go through working capital, those are, those are typically the, 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 the factors that, that or the, the kind of red flags that will make you sit up and, and rethink whether or not to invest in a company. The other thing is debt. You do not want long-term debt to be too high or to be growing too rapidly. Obviously, you can forgive a company when they're making a big acquisition, but as Woolworths has taught, has taught us, as famous brands has taught us, as Truett's for that matter has taught us, big acquisitions, big risk, don't even go there. It's, it, I think it's actually a pretty good signal to sell. It's probably a good, a good red flag. See how they handle that acquisition and how they bed it down first before getting involved. Chances are there'll be a stumble along the way and you'll actually get a better entry point. Then the gearing ratio. What does debt look relative to the net asset value of the company? It's assets minus its liabilities. If it's super high, that means they're in the danger zone and you don't want to invest in that company. Net debt to EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest and tax and depreciation and amortization. And looking at your net debt in the context of that, now EBITDA sounds very complicated, but it's basically just operating profit, removing any funny business. If your profits are able to cover your debt, it means that you will be able to trade out of your debt very quickly. You won't be stuck with that massive pile of debt for many years to come. So you want that ratio to be as low as possible. And then there's a nifty figure called the Altman Z, which you can find freely. Um, it's a very complicated calculation, but basically, if it's over two, the company's safe. You don't want to invest in a company with an Altman Z under two, because that means that the probability of them going bankrupt is quite high. So from our analysis, we, we see that Truett has actually been improving its, its working capital cycle. They also have very, very little long-term debt. They only have a big lease liability. Um, the gearing ratio actually has um, Mr. Price and Truett equal, you'll see that Truett has a gearing ratio of 65%, TFG of 51%, but that's just because of accounting funnies. You always want to exclude lease liabilities, which is like future rental payments for the properties that they're in, out of their long-term debt. It's not the, that's not the debt that keeps management teams awake at night, um, but it's because of certain accounting changes recently that have to include it. And then net debt to EBITDA, Mr. Price wins, which means they'll be able to pay off their debt a lot quicker than the other two. And Altman Z, Mr. Price wins as well. They've got an Altman Z of 6.7%, of 6.7, sorry, it's not a percentage, which means there's a very low probability of Mr. Price going out of business soon. And then finally, the cash flow statement. I like to look at cash flow to net income. So if you are going to have net income, so that's basically your profit for the year, does it translate into cash? And you can see that all these retailers have their profit translate into cash in, in spades, but Mr. Price manages to do it um, quite vigorously. Um, and the good thing about that is that they're not just using accounting tactics to make their profitability look impressive. It is actually translating into cold, hot cash. 
call out cash comes back to shareholders or they can use it to, to grow their business. Um, free cash flow is another important metric you want in a retailer positive free cash flow so that they're able to pay dividends, they're able to grow, they're able to afford their to, to afford their their, um, their working capital or to pre-fund their working capital. Um, and it just gives you a good idea of the strength of that of that business when you exclude stuff like capital expenditure and finance costs and all the rest of it. Um, and then cash conversion cycle. So, so how quickly does money go from you recognizing it in your income statement to it actually coming um, in cash in your bank account? So even though Mr. Price, for example, has a better cash conversion cycle, um, we can see that Truers is improving it quite substantially, which is why I gave them, they, they pipped Mr. Price there. TFG didn't disclose it, which I don't like. So, um, so they were out of the running there, but um, Mr. Price won on free cash flow and cash flow to net income as well. Then after you've analyzed the results, it's extremely important to look at what has happened since, because a lot can change from when a company releases results. For example, Mr. Price has a March year end. So a lot has happened since March, right? They put out a trading update in, in um, I think it was in July. They said for April to June, um, retail sales increased by, I think it was about 7%. Um, it was slightly, it was slightly disappointing. It's definitely a slowdown from, from the, the previous week, but they have seen sales growth accelerating, which is always a good sign and the Studio 88 sale went through. So that should at least boost their, the Studio 88, sorry, it's not a sale, it's a purchase by Mr. Price. It's a sale from the owners of Studio 88 or the previous owners, but that should boost their sales as well. It's a relatively small acquisition, so it's not something that I would be specifically concerned about. Um, they, they didn't have to actually take on debt to finance it. So, um, because it's not really going to, move the scale too much it's not a, a red flag as to divest from the share or to not invest in the share tfg released a trading update very strong retail turnover up 21.6 percent so that looked pretty good and towards nothing much out um, since they released results in september but as i mentioned um it seems as if michael mark tenure could finally uh, be coming to an end uh, they appointed two deputy ceos which I, it is a little bit strange, right? They back your back your winning horse, pick your horse, stick to him um, or her. Uh, deputy two two CEOs um, is is never a good sign. And then finally, we get to valuation. What measure is best? So in a perfect world, all of us will have access to um, to analyst forecasts, and we'll be able to look at stuff like forward PEs and forward price to book and We'll be able to look at what is expected. In a perfect world, we will all be able to build models and make earnings forecasts. But the reality is that not everyone has the skill to do it. Um, it is very tedious. To get access to forward forecasts is extremely expensive um, and not, not everyone can afford to do so. So I think a, a metric that I still like, but that should probably be approached with caution is the, the PE ratio. So basically it tells you where's the company trading relative to what it was able to earn in profit over the last 12 months. Now it can be misleading because it's looking backwards. So it's always important to keep in mind what management has said, what information has come out around the company since then. Um, are there any, spe any specific red flags that you should be aware of? Um, but it's a, it's a decent metric to, to look at. And it's always good to look at this relative to the peers and relative to itself. So in this case, the orange bars are the PE ratios, the historic PE ratios for Mr. Price, uh, the Fushini Group, and for Truitts. You can see that Truitts is the um, is the cheapest of the bunch. But if you go back to the income statement, you would have seen that they actually grew the slowest um, of, of all of these companies, and that they're probably going to continue to grow the slowest. If you think about where in the market they are playing and where we are from a macroeconomic perspective, then you can also look at it relative to itself. So try and find raw data for PEs over time and see where the what the average PE has been. 
So what we have here is the average PE over the last five years. And you can see that Mr. Price, even though its growth prospects don't look much poorer than the last five years, if you consider that we went through COVID, it's trading at a, at a, at a discount to where it usually trades. It usually trades at around a 17 and a half times uh, historic PE. It's trading at around 14 and a half times. The Bushini group slightly cheaper than history, but, but not, not a big difference. So it probably doesn't look that uh, attractive um, if you consider it from, from that perspective and face it, it's trading at, the, at more or less the same level as Mr. Price at the moment, uh, whereas historically it's traded at a discount to Mr. Price. And then Truworths looks super cheap relative to itself, but we know that there are specific reasons why Truworths looks super cheap uh, relative to itself. Although I must say, when I looked at the metrics that I always look at, and I actually combed through it quite carefully, it truly surprised me on, on quite a few metrics in the income statement balance sheets and in the, in the cash flow statement. So then it's time to pull the trigger, right? So which one are we going to, which one are we going to choose? Um, and it, it's a difficult one because, um, as I mentioned, Mr. Price and the Fashini Group are both well positioned um, amid tough macros, right? Um, the Fushini Group has the most diverse business model. They've recently also bought like dial a bed. So I mean every 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 10 to 15 years everyone's gonna buy a new mattress. I know I've been using dial a bed. It's just easy. They drop it at your house. Um, Mr. Price has a very strong management team. They've been with the business forever. Um, Mr. P Mr. Price and True is actually did the best when we looked at the at the financials. Um, Mr. Price, the Fashini Group has the strongest growth, but Mr. Price is pushing pushing quite hard and weak macros could be supportive. Um, and then Mr. Price looks cheap, looks cheap, but not as cheap as true is. So again, it goes back to what type of investor are you? I'm a, I'm a hardcore quality girl, so I would probably go for the likes of a Mr. Price, but for a hardcore value guy like my husband, um, I'm pretty sure he's already built a, a position in true is. Um, but whatever you decide ultimately after analysis like this, uh, number one rule, back yourself. And that's it, Simon. That was my very quick run through. No, that was perfect. <laughs> that was perfect and spot on. And, and I looked at it tons up. I particularly at the point where you said, like, if there's a lot of banks, just go buy the Finney 15. And, and that's often where, 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 where I end up. And I, I, you ended on the point is back yourself. And I think that's a key point as well. And I know. We've got a lot of newbies in the audience this evening, and it's a little bit scary when you're starting this. Um, but but at the end of the day, you've put in. The, you know what the worst thing is? You do all the hard work, and you come out and you decide yeah. to buy the stock, and then you don't, and then six months later you look back and you should have, because the best way you learn is put some cash in the game. You don't have to go big, just a little bit. Uh, back yourself, and 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 uh, you, you, when you got when you got some money in it, you you, you learn at about twice the speed. Yeah, and I mean, you you are going to make mistakes, right? Um, I think oh, yeah. everyone who's listened to 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 me in the past knows that at one point I bought Taste Holdings. <laughs> like it's it's the it's the most embarrassing thing I've ever done. Um, it's now called Luke's Holdings. They were so embarrassing they had to change their name. Yeah. But that's how you learn about stocks, making those making those mistakes, and and obviously don't bet the house, right? So I mean, I only had five grand invested in in Taste Holdings. Thank goodness. Um, but yeah, it's a it's it's a learning curve. Yeah, it is, and you always learning. I mean, I I I liked your, your thing. Big deals, red flags, and and I mean, I, I have a new rule of my investing. If I own a stock, because I owned both Truers and Famous Brands when they did their offshore misadventures, um, and my new rule is if I own a share and they go and do a giant size deal offshore, initially the market gets all excited and everything goes up. As soon as it starts to fade. I'm going to take my money and run. Folks, if you've got questions, drop them in the Q&A box. Uh, Chantal, one that's come through is, is what about talking to management? Uh, do you have one-on-ones with management? And what about presentations? And one of the key things with the pandemic now is that most of these results presentations are now online uh, and well worth attending. I'm assuming you attend presentations. Do you speak to management much? Yeah, so I mean, at, at, at times I speak to management, especially when there's not a lot of information in the market. So when I'm I'm looking at smaller stocks, I do tend to to seek out management to chat to them. Um, usually, investor relations are actually quite keen to to set up a site visit or set up some time um, for management to to take you through the business. 
Um, I mean, but obviously as a professional investor, I get granted this courtesy, right? So not, not everyone will have that opportunity. Um, most people will have to make their own site visit. So um, that, and that's also something that you can absolutely do. So if you look at something like Mr. Price, for example, um, you don't have to be invited by management in order to go and look what a Studio 88 looks like or to go and surf the Yappy Chef website or to go and check out a power fashion when you drive past one. Um, go check it out, see what it's about and decide if it's something that, that you think makes sense and that you think that people would want to um, spend money at or whether or not you think, wow, they just bought an absolute dog. Um, and be open-minded, right? So when you are doing your own personal site visits, be open-minded as well and try and think outside of your own um, uh, your, your own situation or your own life and the stuff that, that, that you enjoy and that you like. But start thinking about what would, a, what would an average South African enjoy? What would appeal to a broader audience? Uh, what does happen when people are forced to, to trade down? And, and you can do this for almost any stock, right? There are very few stocks where you can't have your own little site visit. I think it's probably more complicated when it comes to the miners. Yeah. Um, but when you're looking at the industrial stocks, um, you can sample the beer, right? Um, <laughs> you, can, you can go to the Cartier shop and look through the window. They'll probably chase you out. <laughs> um, I've never tried to go in, but I mean, you can absolutely do your own research like that as well. And, um, and yeah, I mean, a great way to learn about a company and its management team and get a feel for management. People always talk about a feel for management is to, to attend those management presentations. I personally miss attending them um, in person, um, but you still get a good idea of the, the type of team that you're dealing with when you are looking at a webinar. Although I do suspect they don't answer all the tough questions. Uh, no, they don't. Um, and I take your point, and particularly with the larger sort of top 40 stocks, you know, the management might not be so keen, but I find with the small caps, and you know, way back when I was just a, a, a complete unknown, I, I remember phoning CEOs, just phoning the, the, the number on the website, getting through to a CEO and having a 20 minute chat with them. Um, they were more than happy. And, and, and you know, even if it is, you know, one of the bigger top 40s is, 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 is speak to IR, get on their mailing list, see what they can do. Yeah. Um, you know, th th there's, there's absolutely uh, uh, no harm in, in, in that whatsoever. Um, and, and my other trick is when I go and particularly in the retail space, I'll speak to staff. Uh, get a sense from them. How busy has it been? How, how's how's this Christmas versus last Christmas? Uh, are you getting bonuses? Um, and, and you find staff very very happy to talk. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and Simon, I mean, even just the the general demeanour of a staff member, um, you can you can tell when a place is pumping and and people are busy versus when they're pretty bored or they feel mistreated or they're not interested in even making eye contact. Yeah. Um, it's probably a, another red flag, specifically when it comes to, to retailers. Yeah. Um, a couple of folks are saying that, 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 some, that some of the online brokers, yeah, they offer research. Some of them have got the consensus yeah. as well. Comes from, usually from, excuse me, profile media. Maybe not as deep as a, as a Bloomberg, uh, but again, it, it, it sort of, it's, it's building that preponderance of evidence more than anything else, and it's a bit there that you can add to it. Uh, question coming from Bruce. In the bear market, is it all right to have ETFs in our portfolios or best to have actual stocks? Bruce, I've, I, I don't sell ETFs. Well, that's not true. I have a core of ETFs, which is my sort of generic uh, uh, large market based, mostly the core shares global one. Um, and then I have some tactical positions. But those core ETFs I never sell. The tacticals are sold when the story fundamentally changes. Um, Chantal, I mean, it, it's not fun holding an ETF during a market like this. But, uh, you know, we, we've both been through this before and we know that ultimately markets recover. Yeah, a bear market is a great opportunity to actually start buying ETFs because they will recover as the market recovers. So it's impossible to call the bottom, right? So I can't say, uh, I mean, a week a week ago, um, the fear and greed index was a peak fear. And then we had another crash um, in, in the US this morning and then it recovered in the middle of the day. But yeah. it, it does feel as if markets are very, very negative at the moment. Um, and even though you could still have a little bit of short term weakness, impossible to 
to, to call a bottom, but ETFs and a lot of these sector-specific ETFs are starting to look like really good value. So um, it's, it's a good opportunity rather than something to be fearful of in a bear market. Yeah, great question coming through uh, from Adam. He's asking, what about uh, uh, directors and like and, and them holding shares in, in, in the business as well? I mean, I, I, I want to preface it. I know directors often sell shares and people get all skittish. And my argument is that directors are going to be net sellers because it's how they get paid. It's yeah. how they get rewarded. They're going to be sellers. Um, I quite like directors buying. That tells me something. And you want them to have some shares. Yeah, you want you want their incentive to be lined up with shareholders, right? So you want them to have skin in the game. Um, wow, I'm just I'm just uh, <laughs> my English is just fantastic today. But, but you want them to have skin in the game, right? You want them to hurt when <laughs> when um, when the company comes under pressure, and you want them to also reap the benefits of their hard work um, when things go well, or, or well, the benefits of of maybe not their hard work, but being in the right place at the right time, right? But I'm not scared of directors selling. I mean, exactly what you said, um, Simon. They they get they get um, especially executive directors get compensated with stock, so it makes absolute sense for them to to sell down the, that exposure because as any person, you don't want to be overexposed to one specific share, especially not with the bias that comes along with being overexposed to a company that you work for. So you want to have a diversified portfolio, you don't want to be overexposed, and maybe you need the money to pay for school fees. Um, <laughs> you, you never know what people's personal circumstances are, but as you mentioned, a potential green flag um, if directors are buying, because that means they think that the share is cheap and they don't care that they're already overexposed. Yeah. Folks, I'm getting way more questions than we're going to get to, and I will finish on time because People have got places and things to go to. But, of course, you can always find Chantal on Twitter as well. Another great question from Adam. He's talking around the presentations, and, and he's noticed a trend. And I've spotted it a few times as well when the only person presenting is the CEO. Um, contrasted where often they'll bring usually the CFO will come in, maybe head of operations, maybe even the head of one or two of their divisions. Does that bother you that it's almost a, a, a one-person show if there's just the CEO? Or are we maybe reading too much into it? Well, I mean, it depends on the size of the company and the complexity of the company, right? But, I mean, generally, I would like to hear from the CFO um, when it comes to the to the financials. And, and one of the, the big red flags when it comes to, um, to investing is these big personality CEOs. So it, I'm, I'm quite fearful of big personalities. Um, I, well, like I admitted the taste holdings thing, right? They used to have this big personality CEO. I'm not going to name names, but, but who would kind of draw you in with his big personality. Um, Mr. Uister was one of those people who draw you in with his big personality. Um, and often when a CEO is that dominant, it's when they take over the entire show and, and it's, yeah. it's, it could be a potential red flag. It's not necessarily an issue, specifically if you have a, a smallish company that's not too complicated, um, but it's not something that I like. Uh, questions coming through. So I, I put it, I'm putting some links in the, in the chat box. I use a service called Koifin, although it's not very good on South Africa, but it's fairly cheap. Uh, it's $15 a month, so it's not anywhere near the Bloomberg type of stuff, which also gives you a lot of folks are saying, where do you find historic PE data and that sort of thing? And that's where I'm finding it from is Koifin. A lot of folks yeah. saying, will the video be available? Yeah, it will be up later this evening. Again, I've dropped the link in there. Uh, a, a great question, and then I lost it. It's from Wayne. It's back. How often are you reviewing your 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 personal portfolio along these lines? Now, but you know, you, you've got a position, you've bought a stock. Uh, uh, how often do you go back to see if you still want to hold it? So, I mean, as I admitted, I look at my portfolio every single day, yeah, but I don't trade every day. <laughs> I can't help myself. I have to look like I have to sort it versus what's performing best, what's performing poorly. But the nature of my work is that I look at every single. Well, I look at my team looks at 140 JSE listed stocks, and we have to have an opinion on every single one of those stocks, which means that every time this company releases results, um, we have to analyze it and we have to analyze it in, in, um, in pretty specific detail. Um, and then we have to put it together a report, we have to send it to our clients, and we have to publish it on our website. So, the nature of my job 
helps me and forces me to look at these stocks continuously. But I think that a good a good way of of kind of mitigating your risk as a, a retail investor that's not necessarily in the in the industry is to at least at least look at financial statements. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, full year results and interim results. And if there's a big acquisition or a big corporate action, it's also time to rethink your exposure. Yeah, fair point on that. Great question from Pierre. How do you evaluate IPOs? Because a lot of what you were talking around in this presentation, we can pull the data from the prospectus, but of course there's no yeah. there's no historic PE, there's no beta, there's no RSI. Do you just kind of work without that information? Yeah, so with an, with an IPO, I, because I have that expertise, I usually build a, a model from scratch, a discounted cash flow model from scratch. There are some there are some shortcuts that you can also that you can also use um, when when it comes to that. Usually, what a company does when they provide a prospectus or IPO documentation is they actually give you some forecasts in terms of what they expect earnings and dividends to be over time. So um, you can go ahead and you can actually um, work out what you think what well what you what the, the dividend yield or the PE would be for that stock. If you don't have forward calculations, you can work out, for example, you can look at what is the average PE for all the companies in that sector. So for example, for retailers, it would be around 15 times. So then you can work out with the earnings that they, the earnings per share that they've provided you or the earnings in total, you can multiply that by 15 times and then you can get to what would be a fair market cap relative to the rest of the sector and evaluate it from there. It seems pretty complicated, but it's a it's a very simple ratio once you actually have it in front of you. But yeah, probably the, the short answer is use the average data of the peer group in order to make an assessment of what you have in front of you when it comes to an IPO. Yeah, um, and just as a sidebar, an IPO is almost never a good. <laughs> <laughs> well, except for a few times. I, I'm old enough to remember 2000, to remember the LTX boom of, uh, 2005, six, but I take your point. Uh, uh, IPO, yeah, not often great. When you when you looked at the uh, of the PEs of the three different stocks and their 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 five year and the thing, you you kind of like you. I think you said something along the lines of, yeah, not a big fan of PE. Uh, is it because it's a fairly blunt instrument? So it doesn't. It it it's very short term, right? So a, a historic PE will only look at one year back. It won't look at what has happened over time. So you can't use it in isolation. You have to look at what has happened over time. And a forward PE is again, it's it's either it's it's only 12 months. So um it can be easily distorted by something like a, a bad acquisition in the past or um a weird market cycle or some strange impact on short-term impact on earnings. Um, you would want to you would want to look at what the prospects for the company are going way forward. So I mean, a PE is a blunt instrument, but it's a but and, and I I don't love a PE, but I think for in terms of what you can access, um, it is probably the most valuable out of the valuation metrics that you can access readily without having to have a um, a full service broker or uh, a subscription to anything. Okay, uh, and I just try to find your Twitter handle. There's two Chantal Marxes in the world. Who knew that? Oh no, <laughs> oh, I do. I, the one's a motorcycle model. Yes, she's a motor. I'm not sure what a motorcycle model is. Um, I'll drop your Twitter handle. The correct one with the underscore uh, in the chat as well. We will see. Yes that on its way. Ladies and gents, we'll park that there. Questions have ended uh, and we're running up against time. Uh, Chantal, you're an absolute rock star. That was absolutely brilliant. Really appreciate your time this evening. Ladies and gents, to all of you there, uh, really appreciate your attending. We had a really strong turnout. Remember, two more events, November, uh, talking BEE shares with Craig Gradage, and then December, hopefully we're live back at the JSC, and that will be me presenting for the last one this year. Chantal, thanks very much.